Well, last Tuesday night, Anthony did a great job setting up uh, the letters of the seven churches uh, in chapters 2 and 3 when he went through chapter 1. He told us in the beginning, which I love this intro, uh, like the president has a State of the Union address uh, to let the country know how we are doing as a country. Well, so too Jesus, here if you will, has a sort of the head of the church address uh, to give the State of the Church's address to the churches. And although this is written to seven churches in Asia Minor, or Turkey as we know today, they are ultimately written to all the churches throughout the whole New Testament era. So these letters are his assessment of the church. Uh, and it would behoove us to know how he views the church uh, and what he deems are its strengths and its weaknesses. Uh, and then what is the remedy for those weaknesses? So each of us needs to have ears to hear, as he says, what the Spirit says. Now there is a pattern. There is a pattern in each of these seven letters, uh, basically how they're written. First, there is an addressing to the church. So we read, so to the angel of the church at Ephesus, right. Or, and to the angel of the church in Smyrna, right. And so on, seven times the same way. Then there is a description of Christ found somewhere in chapter 1. All right, then that is followed by commendations. What's good? Except for the church at Sardis, no good. Uh, and followed by uh, condemnations, except for the churches of Smyrna uh, and Philadelphia. Uh, then instruction is given on what the church is needed to do. And finally, a promise is given to those who are overcomers in the church. Uh, and the first letter is addressed to the church at Ephesus. Uh, and I would like to consider this church this evening in a sermon titled, The Love Letter, using a four-point outline. And they are, the points are, the Lord of the church, the Lord commends the church, the Lord condemns the church, the Lord counsels the church. So let's look at the Lord of the church, verse 1. I'll read it again. To the angel of the church of Ephesus write, These things says he who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks in the midst of the seven golden lampstands. Uh, now this letter is written to the angel of the church of Ephesus. Uh, and there is some debate as to who the angel is. Some say the angel is an actual angelic being who has some kind of connection with the church. And the reason they would claim this is because every other time the word angel is used in the book of Revelation, it means an angelic being. But the Greek word for angel is the same Greek word for messenger. Uh, and it is used five times in the New Testament as a messenger. And I believe the word angel in the seven letters of Revelations 2 and 3 means a messenger. More specifically, the pastors or the elders of the church. I mean, every epistle in the New Testament is written to men. Uh, so why would these seven letters be written to angelic beings concerning the church? Angels are ministering spirits, not church leaders. Now the rest of verse 1 is a description of the one who dictates the letter, and that is Jesus Christ. Uh, and we read that he holds the seven stars in his right hand, uh, which speaks uh, to his honor and to his authority. And, and he walks in the midst of the seven golden lampstands. And Revelation chapter 1 verse 20 tells us what the seven stars are and what the seven lampstands are, what that they mean. And there we read, the mystery of the seven stars, which you saw in my right hand, and the seven golden lampstands. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands, which you saw, are the seven churches. All right? So, so the stars uh, are angels or pastors or elders. Lampstands are the churches. And I'll speak more about the lampstands when we get to verse 7. Uh, and these things tell us some stuff uh, that was important to those churches and to us as well. Uh, they tell us that Jesus is Lord of the church. He is over the church. He owns the church because he purchased the church with his blood. It's his. It's not the pastor's church. It's not the people's church. Right? It's not the Baptist church. It's Jesus' church. He owns the church. He runs the church. And he deeply cares about the church. And he provides for the church. And he protects the church. He loves the church. So no one can do a thing anything to prevail against it, right? He said that to Peter in, in Matthew 16, uh, that, that nothing can prevail against the, the, the growing of his church. Uh, it also tells us uh, that, that, that he knows exactly what's going on 
each of the churches. Tells us he's walking in the midst of them. Also, that tells us he is present in the church. That he never leaves nor forsakes his church. So he's the one that Revelation 1.14 says, has eyes like a flame or fire and he sees everything. Thus, he starts off by telling them the one with all authority, the one they work for, has something to say to them. And that leads us to the second point. The Lord commends the church. He commends the church. Verses 2 and 3, and then we'll see it in verse 6 as well. I know your works, your labor, your patience, and that you cannot bear with those who are evil. And you have tested those who say they are apostles and are not, and have found them liars. And you have persevered and have patience and have labored for my name's sake and have not become weary. Verse 6, but this you have, that you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. All right, so the head of the church, who is Jesus, says, I know everything you do. I know what you think. I know how you operate. And then he will list seven good, seven wonderful things that they do. Uh, and, and one of them is repeated twice, which is they have patience. And let me tell you, this is a pretty good church. This is a pretty good church. Uh, any church today would love to hear these seven commendations from the Lord of the church. We would love to hear it. Uh, trust me, we would be overwhelmed if we received these com commendations. We'd be like, look at this, pack it on. You know, one, two, three, five, six, seven. We would be overwhelmed. And so he says, I know your works. I know your works. I know you're a working church and not a lazy church. I know that you are busy about my business. I know you labor. I know your labor. And this word labor means it's an intense labor. It's a labor with trouble and toil. So this is no just doing a little this or that. This is like really digging down and going deep. It's labor to the point of exhaustion. You see, it cost them something, and they were willing to pay it. They were willing to pay it. This wasn't a Sunday morning only crowd, in and out kind of thing. Uh, they, they, they didn't sit back and just sing a few songs and let me get preached at for 45 minutes. No. Uh, this, this, was, this was not a church where 20% of the people do 80% of the work. It's not a church where only a handful of people come out to prayer meetings or Bible studies, evangelistic efforts. No, this is a body of believers who put effort into the life and work of the church. They care about the church. They weren't lax. They weren't bystanders. They weren't marginal or occasional attenders or participants. And the reality here is that Jesus knows exactly what our works are. He knows. And, and, and what our labor is, he knows that too. And it behooves us to make sure that we're doing what he commands. We're doing what he commands. So then he says, I know your work. I know your labor. And then he says, I know your patience. I know your patience. And patience means endurance, steadfastness. They didn't budge. They kept going. They didn't give up. They didn't give up when the going got tough. They didn't, they didn't bolt out. They stayed right there. They didn't throw in the towel when persecution and trials and troubles hit. They did not stop proclaiming the gospel even though it was very unpopular with some. Uh, and, and we see an excellent example uh, of, of works, labor, and patience with the saints in Thessalonica. So in 1 Thessalonica chapter 1, verse 3, Paul said uh, to them when he prays, uh, he remembers without ceasing your work of love, labor of faith, and patience of hope. And our Lord Jesus Christ, in the sight of God our Father. All right. The difference between the Thessalonians and the Ephesian church here in Revelation 2 is that their labor, work, and patience was anchored in faith, love, and hope. Well, the next commendation Jesus gives them is that they could not bear with those who were evil. They could not bear with those who were evil. Uh, and those who are evil literally means those of a bad nature, base, troublesome, destructive. Uh, so, so they refused to allow apostasy and immorality and godlessness to go on in the church. They didn't, they didn't allow it. Uh, they would not compromise on sin or tolerate it for peace and harmony and unity. They wouldn't do that. This church right, practiced church discipline, something very few churches in our day do. They practiced it. They called sin, sin. They called it sin. They dealt with gossip. 
They dealt with divisive people. They took sin seriously. And then he says, you have tested those who say they are apostles and are not, and have found them liars. So they were very discerning. They didn't just let anybody into the pulpit. Oh, you're a good speaker, come on in. Oh, you're pretty smart, let's have you here. They didn't just do that. Just because someone claimed to be something, that didn't mean anything to them. They needed the proof. Right? Just because they, someone said they were, were a good speaker or had knowledge of the scriptures, that, that, didn't, that didn't blow them away. It didn't enamor them. No, they tested men who claimed to be apostles or teachers or preachers. How did they test them? By God's word. How else? By their lives. Jesus said, you'll know them by their fruit. You'll know them by their fruit. Speaking of false teachers, what's the fruit? Well, the fruit of what they teach or preach and how they live their life. So they tested them. They took 1 John 4, 1 very seriously, which says not to believe every spirit, but test the spirits whether they are from God. So then they were diligent to protect the flock from error and from heresy. And this is one of the major tasks of an elder, to protect the people of God from error and from heresy. And, and Paul warned this very church some 40 years before about this very thing in Acts 20, verses 29 and 30. He's on his way to Jerusalem. He knows he's going to be arrested. He don't know if he'll see them again. And he meets up with the Ephesian elders in Acts 20. And he's basically telling them, listen, I'm going, but you need to know there are going to be false teachers coming uh, and, and they're going to come from the outside and from the inside. And you need to protect the flock. So we read in verses 29 and 30, he said, for I know this, Paul knows it, that after my departure, savage wolves will con- come in among you, not sparing the flock. Also, from among yourselves men will rise up, speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after themselves. Paul says from the outside they're going to come in, and from the inside they're going to be raised up. How do you know? Through the word. You test it to the word. And decades later, the Ephesian church was still taking Paul's warning to heart. Well, then Jesus says, you have persevered, which means to bear with, to take up in order to carry. So then they continually brought the gospel to friends and foes. They continually anchored on the word of God. All right? they, and they did all of this, Jesus said, for my name's sake. They did all of it for Jesus' name's sake. Uh, it was for his name's sake and not the pastor's name's sake or the church's name's sake. Everything they did from their works labor, patience, and not bearing with those who were evil and testing false teachers and prophets was all, was all done for Jesus' name's sake. They knew that his honor and his glory and the advancement of his kingdom was at stake. So they were careful to be Christ-centered in all things. Well, then we read at the end of verse 3, they did not become weary, not become weary. So they didn't quit. They didn't give up. Uh, they didn't grow weary in well-doing. They, they didn't grow weary from turning the other cheek, so to speak, or from preaching the gospel, though probably they didn't see a whole lot of fruit from it. Right? They didn't succumb to disappointment uh, and ingratitude and criticism and rebellion and lack of response. And sadly, I personally, I personally know how easy it is to become weary in the labor. Well, verse 6 gives us the last commendation, and that is they hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which Jesus himself also hates. Uh, And we really don't know who the Nicolaitans are, although there are many theories. Uh, And in chapter 2, verse 15 of Revelation, uh, we see that the church of Pergamos uh, had those who held to the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which Jesus hated as well. And so, so, so they allowed it in their church. And many commentators see a connect between the doctrine of Balaam Uh, and the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, uh, for they are each named as a problem in the church at Pergamos, uh, which is why many believe the deeds of the Nicolaitans uh, were were like those who followed the doctrine of Balaam, which was basically idolatry and sexual immorality. Idolatry and sexual immorality. The late uh, second century church father Irenaeus uh, said about the Nicolaitans, he said, they were without restraint uh, in the indulgence of the flesh and practiced fornication and the eating of food sacrificed to idols. 
Uh, so the Nicolaitans were about loose living, and they used Christian liberty as a license to sin. And Jesus said, he hates that. He hates that, right? We were saved to be holy as he is holy. Not that we're going to ace holiness in this life, but that's the goal, to live more like Christ. Some, right, some will say, you know, I have, I have Christian liberty, and we do have Christian liberty, but they'll use it for, for loose living, for, even for sin. Uh, and so Jesus says, I hate that. I hate that. Uh, and, and he commends them, he commends the Ephesian uh, church for hating that as well. Uh, so they were a church that was serious about the Christian life, they were serious about sound doctrine, and they were serious about holy living. And, and thus they labored and worked and toiled and were patient and persevered and battled error and hated evil and sin in the camp. Uh, and I'm going to guess uh, they didn't waste time as a, as a body of God, you know, playing video games and spending hours and hours a day on social media or entertaining themselves to death. I think they were busy. Right? They were busy about kingdom stuff. They were active and committed and sold out kingdom workers. But with all of that, with all of that, and that is a lot, still there was something missing. And that leads us to our third point. The Lord condemns the church in verse 4. Nevertheless, I have this against you, that you have left your first love. Well, Jesus says you're a great church. You're a model church. But then he says, nevertheless, nevertheless. And I can just imagine what it must have been like, because back in, in those days when, when a letter would be sent to a church, what they would do is the leaders of the church would, would read it to the whole church. So like everybody's hearing the letter in Ephesus, and then they're going to send it around to other churches as well. And so I can imagine what, they must have, what it must have been like when this letter was being read for the first time to the Ephesian Christians. Right? How great they must have felt when they heard, you're doing good here, you're doing good there, you're doing great here, you're doing great there. Like seven times. But then out of the blue, it, all of you say, hear this word, nevertheless. You're like, oh, it's like the but. Nevertheless. Things are great, things are great. I love you, I love you, I love you, but. And you're waiting for the hammer to drop. And it does drop. Right? It must have been like a dagger in their heart, so to speak. Nevertheless, I have this against you. We don't, want to have, we don't want Jesus to have anything against us, but he's got something against them. And that is that you left your first love. And I've said this, and I used this illustration a long time ago, but I'll use it again. It's like, like school's almost over, right? Kids, homeschool kids, kids in regular school, it's almost over, right? And, and you're going to get a report card. And it's like, if you got a report card that said, math, A+. Plus. Science, A+. Plus. History, A+. Plus. Geography, or whatever we take today, A+. Plus. Um, you know, and down the line, like, like seven A+. Pluses, and you're like, this is going good. And then all of a sudden, you know, Jim, D-. Minus. Like, oh, D-. Minus. If you're like me, all you're looking at is that D-. Minus. Like all those A's, they, they, they lose their, uh, their cachet. They lose their, 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 their power. Like D minus, this D minus is a doozy. And it's, it's not you're showing up late for service. Or it's not that your church website is really archaic and needs some updating. This D minus is not for any of those things. Not that you don't sing well, that's not a D minus for singing here. No, no, this D minus is a doozy. You have left your first love. And, and that had to be like, a, like, like an arrow in the heart. And there are three camps as to what the first love is. Some say the first love is evangelism. So you don't love the lost and have a passion to see the lost saved like you once did. You're lazy now. You're getting fat, so to speak. Some say the, your first love is your love for the brethren. So you don't love the brethren like you used to love the brethren. And some say the first love is Jesus himself, which is what I would agree with. Why? Because if you're loving Jesus, then you can't help but love the brethren. And if you're loving Jesus, you can't help but want to see people love him too that don't know him. So that is evangelism for you. I mean, it would be difficult to be in love with Jesus and cold towards his people. And then could care less about the lost. Well, with that said... I want you to notice that they left 
their first love. They didn't lose their first love. It's important because you leave something intentionally. When we're done tonight, you're going to leave here intentionally. You're not going to stick around. You're going to go home at some point. You leave intentionally. Right? They, they, you leave something intentionally. You don't lose something intentionally. I don't lose my phone intentionally. No, I go crazy, and I make my wife look all over the place for it and call me. That's not intentional. So, so you do things, or you don't do things, which cause you to drift away from your love for Christ. Uh, and, and this is amazing because the Ephesian church looks like a church that is moved by their love for Christ. You would say, if any church loves Jesus, it's got to be this church. It's got to be the Ephesian church. Look at all these good things they do. Look at all these good things they do. And I'm sure they, they, they felt good about those good things that they did. All right? But they, they don't do them anymore. They don't love him like they used to love him anymore. Their fl the flame in their hearts has simmered even though they did many good things in his name. You see, they did a lot of work for him, but they weren't truly worshiping him. They did a lot of work for him, but they weren't truly worshiping him. Uh, and they, they, they now had what is known as a, a, a cold orthodoxy. They had good doctrine, they believed truth, and they were standing on it, but it was cold. It wasn't, it wasn't moving the heart like it used to. They labored out of obligation, out of duty, out of commitment, but not out of love for Christ. Paul said, the love of Christ compels me. The, the love Christ has for me makes me love him so that I'm driven to live for him and to, and to do all the things I do and suffer all the things I suffer for the sake of his glory. Right? It was the love of Christ for Paul Thus, and then Paul's love for Christ that drove him to, to, to the labor he labored. Right? Their love for him didn't motivate those things like it once did. Right? They, they did what Christians were supposed to do, and they did them well. But a Christ word motivation was missing. Maybe they, they became so familiar with him, so familiar with the gospel, so familiar with the cross, right? so familiar with the blood of Christ and how he has saved them that it kind of became same old, same old for them. And their hearts didn't skip a beat for him anymore. So, so activity had replaced affection. Programs had replaced passion. And duty had replaced devotion. And now Matthew 10.37 could no longer be said of them that they love Jesus more than father or mother or sister and brother and the list is long right there, Right? You see, there was a time when they loved Jesus above all else. There was that time. And like Mary, they would sit at his feet listening to him and gazing into his eyes, so to speak, mesmerized by his love, mesmerized by his word. But now they're like Martha. They're doing stuff. They're doing stuff. And by the way, we need to do things. Like this, oh, Pastor Peter, we don't have to do anything. We just love Jesus. Well, you should love Jesus, but that should bring about good works. He needs to be the motive for those good works, right? And you need to know that Jesus doesn't, doesn't want our works of labor if, they don't, if they're not done out of love for him. Everything has to be done with a love for him and a desire to please him. He doesn't want your offering if it's not given with a heart for him, uh, or as, as, as 2 Corinthians 9, 7 says, given with a cheerful heart. You could, you could dump a ton of money on, on the church, and if it's not done with a heart out of love for Christ, it's, it, you know, God doesn't accept it. It's, it's, not, it's not an offering he accepts. So doing what is correct for the wrong reason or with the wrong motive, well, that would be sin. To not love Christ above all else, well, that would be sin as well. Spurgeon said... A church has no reason being a church when she has no love within her heart or when love grows cold. Another man said, when love dies, orthodox doctrine becomes a corpse. Well, how do we know if we've left off our love? Uh, and, and the question we need to ask before this is, what is that first love? 
Uh, and that first love is how your heart was smitten with Christ when you came to believe he saved you from your sins. When you knew that at the cross the handwriting of requirements for your sins were wiped away and they were washed away in the blood of Jesus and his unending love for you won your hearts toward him. And you couldn't get enough of him. He was always on your mind. You couldn't wait to go to church, to sing to him, to hear about him, to talk about him. Right? And you would get to church early, early so you could prepare your heart to come before him and worship him. And you wouldn't miss a Bible study. You wouldn't miss a Sunday school. You wouldn't miss an evangelistic opportunity. If the church was out sharing, then you wanted to do it too. And you loved to pray to him. And you constantly read your Bible. You marked it up. You wrote down questions to ask the more mature believers about them when you saw them. Hey, what does this mean? And you delighted to read good books about him from men who were dead and men who were alive. So in a nutshell, you were consumed with Christ. And the question is, is this describing you? And is this describing how you are today? Were you once like this? If you're a believer, I'm telling you, I think you were like this. But are you that way today? Because if not... Well, you might have left your first love. And how do you know that? How can you tell that? Well, maybe your devotional life is very sporadic. Maybe meditating on the Word of God is no longer pleasurable to you. You don't have the time. Maybe you hardly pray like you used to pray. You don't come to church anticipating meeting with Jesus and hearing from Him. Maybe you just come occasionally and oftentimes, maybe very late. And you no longer come to Bible studies and prayer meetings because you're busy and you're tired and there are things to do at home and the schedule is tight and the kids need this and the kids need that. Listen, those are all real things. But when the heart is driven and moved, when Christ has high priority in the heart, everything else sort of, sort of trickles down, down under that. And you don't fellowship with believers like you used to. And you're really not accountable to anyone anymore. And Christ, as we sang tonight, is not your best thought by day or by night. And if those things would be true, then, then you would have left your first love. And then what you need is found in our last point. Here's the hope. Point four. The Lord counsels the church in verses five to seven. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen. Repent and do the first works, or else I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. He who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give to eat from the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Well, Jesus condemns the Ephesian church for leaving their first love, uh, and then he gives them a remedy. He gives them a solution, if you will. And the solution comes with three R's. The three R's are remember, repent, and return. Remember, repent, and return. So remember, remember from where you have fallen from. Remember what it was like when Christ was your first love. Uh, remember when all that thrilled your soul was Jesus. Remember when all you wanted was more of Him. Learn more of Him, to talk about Him, to hear things on the radio or wherever about Him. Remember how you couldn't wait to open up your Bible or get down on your knees and pray. Remember how you love to listen to sermons and then discuss them with a brother or a sister. Re remember how, how you were hot to tell others about your first love. Maybe you didn't know a whole lot about them, but you're going to tell them anyway because you want them to know. Remember about the thoughts you had about him when you were laying in bed. Remember how you were moved in your soul when you sang songs about him. You know, my whole Christian life, I've been, I'm a whistler, and I whistle hymns and Christian songs. I guess I drive my wife crazy a little bit. But, but she knows there's something wrong spiritually when I'm not whistling. Like when there's a long period of time where there's no whistling going on. And she'll say to me, you okay? You know, I don't hear you whistling. So it's a good sign for me, I guess. So then... Remember how far you have fallen. 
And memory is a powerful tool. That's why, that's why we're told to remember the Lord's body uh, and his blood as we partake in the Lord's table. Remember. Remember what he did. Remember what he sacrificed. Remember what it cost to make you who you are in him. Jesus told his disciples, remember Lot's wife. Listen, you could be almost, almost out of that, that destruction and ultimately your, your heart could still be back in Sodom. Remember that. Remember what the prodigal son remembered, how well his father's servants were treated, and that they had plenty to eat. And then it moved him to repent and to return to his father. He had to remember first. Gee, you know, things were better back at home with dad. All of his servants, when they were doing good, I'm eating pig food. I'm really not even getting the pig food. But that's all I can get. So our memory is a powerful tool, especially when we remember how our hearts used to swell with love for Jesus when we were first saved. So look at how far you faded away from the love affair that you had with Christ and how cold your love has grown. And then Jesus says, repent, repent, cry out for forgiveness, turn from, turn towards. Because not to love Jesus supremely, not to give him the throne of one's heart, is sin. To be busy doing lots of things for him, but not being passionate for him? That's going to be sin as well. And it needs to be repented of, which means you have to change your mind and your attitude about leaving your first love. And I know that, that, that this is easy to think that, that what you do for Jesus equals loving Jesus, Right? I mean, we do a lot of stuff, and some of us are very busy, and praise God for the servants. We need servants, right? But it's easy, I would think, to think because I do those things, I'm involved in those things, well, that means I love them, right? Well, that, that means I'm, 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 I'm closely connected to them. Maybe not, though. Maybe not. And it's, it's easy to be satisfied with what we do. Yet loving Christ can be absent from those very things that we're satisfied doing. So we need, then, to repent, and then return, and then return, or do the first works. And the first works, uh, you do, uh, you do what you did when Christ was your first love. Do what you did when he was your first love. Nothing new here, I don't think. You know what those first works were. Right? For some, it means just come to church every Sunday. Believe it or not, I have to say it, but that's true. Get here early. Come expecting to be blessed uh, as you sing and hear the word of God, come with expectation. I mean, we're, we're meeting with the king of creation. We're singing and praising and worshiping him together. No, no small thing there. For some it means getting out and sharing the gospel again. Talk to friends and neighbors. Talk to co-workers. Oh, I can't say anything. Well, why can't you say anything? You used to do it. Share the gospel again. For some it means listening to admonishments and rebukes and repenting quickly. Maybe in the beginning you were easy to repent. Oh, some, you, there was a problem, you, God broke you quickly. But now, you got a little thicker and tougher, so to speak. The skin's a little thicker in some areas. For some it means setting aside time daily just to read and pray. Just to read and pray. And that may mean turning off the computer, putting down the iPhone, and taking out the Bible. But whatever it is, do those first works again. Do them again. Because here's the thing. If they don't remember, repent, and return, he says there's going to be consequences. And the consequence will be that he will come quickly and remove their lampstand. Now let me explain what the lampstand was. The lampstand was an article that was in the temple, in the holy place, and it was literally the only light source in the temple. Uh, and the priest would tend to it by filling it with oil uh, and trimming its wick. Uh, and so it would be continually burning and off, giving off light all, at all times. And, and the picture here is of Christ, who is a high priest, walking among the lampstands as he keeps them continually burning. So if they don't repent, if they don't go back to do the first works, Jesus will remove their lampstand. And many commentators see this uh, as Jesus will remove the church or, uh, or, or the church will cease to be. Uh, and, and not too actually far down the road, the Ephesian church was taken away, as by the way, all, all the other six were as well. 
Uh, and I would agree with this, but I think there's, some, there's something much more here. Something much more. Uh, you see, I believe the loss of the lampstand also ultimately means the loss of light. No light. In other words, the lights go out. Con Ed shuts off the power and the place goes dark, so to speak. And what I mean is the power source is gone. The power source is gone. No longer is the Holy Spirit empowering that church. The power source is the Holy Spirit. No longer is he empowering it. The light of the gospel is gone. The power of the gospel has vacated. Therefore, there are no longer true conversions going on. No genuine holy living going on. No victory over sin going on. Instead, it's just dead orthodoxy or lifeless activities or man-driven religion. So it's either revival or removal. And then in verse 7, he closes with a promise or an encouragement and says, He who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give to eat from the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. So he who is spiritually discerning, he who is spiritually sensitive, right, listen, he says, to what I've said and apply it. Now notice in verse 1, it is Christ who is talking to the church at Ephesus. Now in verse 7, it is the Spirit who is talking to all the churches. So the word of Christ and the word of the Spirit are one and the same. Uh, and, and what is written to one church is written to all of the churches for all time. Well, then Jesus says to him who overcomes, I will give to eat from the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. And there is some debate as to who the overcomer is. Some say, well, this is the more obedient Christian, Therefore, they get a better reward. But I disagree with that. I believe the, o o the overcomer is every single born-again Christian, period. Why? Because John says so in his first epistle. In 1 John chapter 5, verses 4 and 5, he says, Whatever is born of God overcomes the world. They overcome it. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Who is he who overcomes the world? He who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. So all believers are overcomers in Christ. All believers overcome the world. And that's because Christ, who they are in, has already overcome the world. In John 16, 33, he said, In the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. And let us remember, not everyone at the church at Ephesus or at Grace Baptist Church or any other church for that matter are true believers. Jesus said that in the visible church or the local church, you would have wheat and tear. You would have believers and unbelievers. But in the end, he would sort out who's who. So the overcomer is the Christian who is a conqueror in Christ. Paul said in Romans 8.37, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. And in Christ, we have overcome the world and we have overcome the penalty of sin and Satan and death and hell. And the evidence that we're overcomers is that we persevere to the end. Persevere to the end. And for those who are and do, they will eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. Uh, and the tree of life is synonymous with eternal life uh, or a continual feeding off of Christ for everlasting life. And, and all believers will have access to the tree of life and the next life. Revelation 22, 14 says, Blessed are those who do his commandments, that they may have the right to the tree of life and may enter through the gates into the city. Which is another way of saying heaven, or where God is. Jesus said to the thief on the cross, who asked him to forgive him, he said to him in Luke 23, he said to him, Truly, truly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise, heaven. Uh, and we know that, that Jesus' spirit went immediately to be with the Father when he gave up the ghost. Well, let me close by saying that this letter is really a critical warning to Grace Baptist Church and her leaders, uh, but the church at large, but particularly her leaders, uh, that we not be a head, hands, uh, and, and feet church without the heart, right? That we not just be head, hands, and feet, and no heart or without love for Christ, driving the head, the hands, and the feet. 
And as a body of Christ, the Grace Baptist Church, we need to ask ourselves, have I left my first love? Is our love for Christ what moves our hearts to live the way we live and to do what we do? So you, do you love him more today than you did when he first saved you? We should all say yes to that, right? Because we know, we know him so much better. It's like when I first met my wife, I'm telling you I love her. I knew that this was something special. But as you know, the years have gone on, I love him more. Because I know him more. So do you love him more today than you did when you first met him or first was saved? And if the answer is yes, then just keep doing the first works. Just keep doing them. Just keep doing what you're doing. You're doing good. Keep staying close to him. But if the answer is no, then Jesus says to you, remember, repent, and return. Remember, repent, and return. And i got to tell you, I don't really think this is very, very hard because you already tasted how pleasurable it was to, to have Jesus fill your heart. You, you know this already. You've experienced this. You've gone to this well, and it was good. Go again. Go back again. Remember what it was like when you first met him. Recognize that your heart has grown cold towards him and ask him to forgive you. Uh, and, and the fruit of that repentance is that you will do what you did when you first met him. Now, if Christ has never been your first love, never been your first love, then, then the one who knows the hearts of all who are in the church also knows your heart. Uh, and he knows that, that you love your sin and you love your pleasure, and you love money, or whatever else it is, and you don't love Him. And He knows your rejection and refusal of Him, and unwillingness to surrender to Him wholeheartedly. And know that your sin has and will overcome you on the day of judgment. No one gets around it. But you don't have to be overcome. You too can be an overcomer in Christ. You too can overcome sin, and the world, and Satan, and death, and hell in Christ. But you must acknowledge your helpless and hopeless condition before God and seek for and cry out to Christ and plead that His blood shed at the cross would cover your sins. And if that is your sincere cry, then you can rest assured He will do just that. And then you too will eat from the tree of life in the paradise of God. Let's pray as the usher or ushers come forward. Father, it is so easy to think all is well because we judge things from outward appearance. But we know Jesus judges the heart and he sees the church for what's really going on. Father, I pray that Grace Baptist Church would be a church that loves Christ first and foremost and that everything we would do, every ministry that we would put our hand to, every effort we would exert would be because of our love for him, that he would be the motive and the drive behind it all. Lord, if, we're, if he's not, please expose that to our own hearts. Grant us those three R's to remember to repent and return. And Lord, for, for the believers in this room, I pray, Father, as they evaluate their own hearts, have they, have they left their first love? Is Christ this day what he is what he was when they first were saved do they love him with all their heart today like they did then if not expose that as well grant them the grace to see it and the grace to repent and return and remember and father for those who may sit here now and aren't truly saved lord would you show them that you know all things and that their sin will find them out and there'll be a day of judgment which they will not escape but today they could cry out to Christ. Today they can know what it means to truly be saved, to truly be loved, and what it means to have life. Lord, would you do that for them? In Jesus' name, amen.